Hello, thank you for having us. I'm here to introduce a group talk about repurposing disposable vape batteries. My name is Becky Stern. Uh, my co-conspirators are Carrie Love, David Rios, and Shuang Tsai, who designed this lovely Vaporwave presentation for us today. We're going to show you why these vape batteries are an issue, show you how to safely dismantle common disposable vapes, and then show you what you can do with them afterwards, including making a cool vape synth instrument. We're giving this talk together because there were several talks about vapes in particular submitted for the Open Hardware Summit this year. And so that points to some convergent thinking about e-waste salvage and the timeliness of the vapes in particular. So just a brief intro, in 2018, Juul had the majority of the market share for e-cigarette sales, and they were developed initially as a stop smoking aid, but Juul also made a bunch of fruity flavors, which happens to appeal to underage kids. So then between 2018 and now, the FDA put a big investigation into the marketing practices and everything and ended up banning Juul from the market in the U.S. with some language that was about the the pod device, the flavored nicotine in the replaceable pod. So there's a loophole in the ban that allows disposable devices to be sold. And and also then because Juul's not on the market, there's a demand that is not met. So there's this opportunity for all of these devices to come in. And there, there's so many of them. You might see them on the street. People throw them away as litter. And then uh, if you have a friend who uses the and then if you have a friend who vapes, they might have a stash that looks something like this. Uh, this definition of disposable isn't acceptable to me. Uh, and I think that uh, this trend isn't having the environment in its like purview at all, right? Because lithium is a precious metal that comes out of the ground. And even if it does make it to proper recycling channels, it's difficult to recycle. And uh, so I think we need to be a little bit more mindful with this material. And that's the motivation behind wanting to creatively reuse these devices that there are suddenly so many of for a logical reason. Uh, and um, it's a sad reason, but it's a logical reason. So here's how you take them apart. You got to wear gloves because the nicotine can be absorbed through your skin. There'll be an end cap or two. And you can pull the whole circuit out. Remember to store your battery safely in a lockbox, preferably, so it doesn't become a projectile. Inside, you'll find that, that big battery we've been talking about, an air pressure sensor for detecting when the user is inhaling uh, to turn on the device, a heat coil to heat up the e-juice inside the sponge, and then a charging circuit that may or may not be appropriate for permanent reuse, depending on... Uh, your definition of a, a well-designed circuit because so, we found when I took apart a bunch of these for my YouTube video I found some legitimate over voltage protection charging chips and I found some boards that just had two PNP transistors on it so that didn't seem particularly safe for long-term use so one of the things you can do that I show how to do in my video is to disconnect uh, the battery from the rest of the circuit put a new connector on it, use it like a regular light poly you bought from the store to run your electronics projects and uh, just charge it with a dedicated charger. I like this SparkFun one with the dip switch because it uh, makes it easy to charge a bunch of batteries with different sizes without much fuss. So then uh, besides taking the batteries out and using them for electronics projects, there are also some interesting ways you can reuse the whole vape you know, use every part of the buffalo. I'm working on a project that's an urban taxidermy diorama that has this dryer vent in it. And I used the vape device kind of as is, plumbed it up to an air pump and I made it into a, basically a little fog machine. And then I want to introduce you to my collaborators for the rest of this talk uh, about showing you how you can make a vape synthesizer. Take it away. Hi, we're Team Vape Synth. I'm Carrie Love. I'm David Rios. I'm Franz Hai. And we're all colleagues at NYU ITP. Now, how did we even decide to make a synthesizer out of a vape? Well, as I mentioned, we all work at NYU ITP, and a student came to me with the question, 
how can I make a miniaturized scent diffuser device that's controllable by Arduino? Now, I was like, hmm, everything that they need to do that, you can find in a disposable vape. And that means they can probably grab one literally off the ground or from any friend who vapes. Now, with this idea in mind, I had it disassembled and on my desk the very next day. So why was I so ready to go out and pick up this electronic trash and take it apart? That's because at my home hackerspace, NYC Resistor, Adam Meyer had been hosting a series of events called Grab the Guts and Use the Guts. In these events, he would bring in street trash electronics, do a live teardown where he would show you each individual part within it and talk to you about how they worked and how you might repurpose it within your own project. Another major inspiration for making a project out of vapes was the Bubble Punk Workshop by Andy Quitmeyer, which was held at Open Hardware Summit last year. Now, one of the things when asked, why did you get into hacking bubble machines? Andy shared that where he lives in Panama, there was tons of balloon waste, both in the jungle and in the oceans, and that he wanted people to celebrate in a way that was more eco-friendly. Bubbles were the thing that came up for him, but at the same time, he was like, nobody can shame another person into changing their behavior. So instead of telling people not to use balloons, let's make using bubbles so exciting that it's the natural choice. So now that we have this disassembled vape, and we also have this idea that we want to make something joyful, David and I had desks at each other at this time, and he and I would always show each other what we were excited about and what we were working on. Now, David teaches a course called New Instruments for Musical Expression. And so a synthesizer was a very natural next step into what we might want to build together. And we had the very first prototype breadboarded within a week of the idea. So when we got to the instrument uh, form factor, we were inspired by a few things. So one was the ocarina. We felt like the shape and the way you hold a vape was very ocarina-like to begin with. The kazoo, because the idea that you would have a funny little instrument in your pocket that's easy to play and kind of silly sounding was so fun. Electronic wind instruments, because it takes the breath, which the vape also takes the breath, and applies it to music and electronic devices. And the theremin, that we would have analog inputs that would shift over sound while we were playing this music. Now, the novel features of this uh, synthesizer vape um, is that we were committed to the original form factor. So that meant using the entire case. Again, because we are in this vape space, we kept the original low pressure sensor and you have to suck on it to play, which is unlike any other instrument I can think of. Now, we wanted to use the maximum use of original parts. So again, we've already used the case, we've already used the sensor, but we also use the battery and the charging circuit. We wanted a speaker on board, so again, this could be a pocket instrument, and we wanted to have an ergonomic instrument-like feel. At this stage is when we are joined by Schwang, who's going to start to tell you about the process for making your own vape synth. To make all of that happen, uh, we basically divide our process into three categories. We need to mechanically alter the uh, enclosure itself. Uh, there are electronics that need to be assembled and soldered and crimp beaded. And there is the final assembly that's going to be fitting everything back into the original form. We knew from the beginning that we want to use as much as the original vape as possible. So the form is part of it. And altering the original enclosure so that our parts can fit back into it is part of the challenge. Here are some of the iterations um, and the processes and the tools that we brought and made. Um, however, you know, the digital fabrication process can be and should be like altered based on your specific workstation situation. So the most lo-fi version that is in this slide, as you can see, is the OG scenes that was literally through a quick clamp and a drill press process. And the point of this is that the reclamation process can be stretched in both ways. It could be either really high-fi or low-fi as you may you want. And final, like our final solution is uh, for our case is using some 3D printers and a top, the tabletop CNC machines. 
Here you can see the jigs and the angles that of overall weight in making. Um, on the left is a list of the jigs that we used. It's basically so that the case can sit in three different angles, slightly angles on two edges and one uh, flat top uh, for the top speaker hole. Um, on the right side is the, the, you can see like how they should be and sitting flat on the bed. Here are some of the photos of them in cutting. Um, the holes in the vise on the third image you can see it is perfect for the T-screws and can fit just on the CNC bed directly. And the copper tape on the cases, as you can see in the images, are used so that the machine can probe the uh, cases and know where exactly and how large the material you're working with. And both solutions are proposed by our shop technician, Ian Cox, after a long battle we've had with the tabletop CNC machine that we we're trying to use. For the circuit, we wanted to use a voltage control oscillator circuit from the Forest MIMS workbook, um, both because that's one of the first circuits I've ever built. And I still, to this day, use Forest MIMS resources uh, because they're open source and easy to read, easy to teach as well. Um, and also because the circuit will run on low power. So it only requires one battery, 3.7 volts, and uh, it uses minimal extra components. Um, the way we're using it is we include the USB battery charger and we use the, the sensor to turn the entire circuit on and off. Um, the only additional things we added were we replaced the one megohm uh, potentiometer with a resistor ladder of photoresistors to simulate playing with buttons. Um, for actually putting the board together, we wanted to use off the shelf parts again. So a proto board, something easy to score and snap at home or in a maker space and um, all through hole components so that you could um, assemble it with just a standard soldering setup. So uh, the circuit uses a 555 timer, a speaker, two um, one microfarad capacitors, and a 1K resistor. Now that we have this photocell ladder that we need to get into our vape case, we needed a way to keep them neatly in place. Schwan came up with this fantastic idea that we could use LED holders instead of for their original purpose for photocells. This has a couple of advantages. They hold them neatly in place. They prevent cutting them on the sharp edges of the vape case and also they insulate. And now that we're trying to have this fussy system, we're putting a photocell ladder into the vape case, just directly soldering the wires wasn't strong enough. It didn't really hold up to the amount of handling it takes to get everything back into place. So I was drawn to use the solution from How to Get What You Want, which is a website by Mika Satomi and Hannah Perner Wilson. Now this website is probably familiar to e-textile pr practitioners, but not so familiar to other hardware hackers. So the solution we picked up from there was to use crimp beads, which are meant for jewelry making. By crimping your parts together, you have both a strong electronic connection and also a strong mechanical connection. After you have the circuit ready, which include a board and the crimp beaded cases with the resistor ladder, um, all you have to do is to try to fit everything back into the case. And because we have done alterations to the case, the whole device itself is no longer airtight. That means that originally when the air pressure sensor is being placed on the bottom, you need to be moved to the top where it's closer to the mouse piece um, so that it's still functional as an air pressure sensor when you uh, suck on the mouse piece. Another thing that we noticed is that because it is a really tight fit with everything in there, to use as much as soft wires as possible when you do the jumping of the sensor or connecting things on the board itself, it's very helpful. Um, but I bet when it comes to actual assembly, you will do something different uh, depending on how you do it. So now we're gonna move to a, a demo video of us playing the novelty version together.
So we called the first version of the vape synth the novelty version because the original inspiration was to repurpose the elf bars um, to make a more fleshed out instrument version. Um, ideally, this version would uh, be something wireless that could be connected to a digital audio workstation like Ableton or Logic, Reaper, etc. cetera, um, which means that in order to create it, we would use uh, some kind of microcontroller like Arduino, and we would connect via MIDI over Bluetooth uh, to the computer and workstation. In actually trying to prototype that, we came across a few setbacks, including power. The microcontroller can't run on uh, two batteries, or on one battery, so we need double batteries. And that also means spatial considerations. We would need a double long vape case. Um, for the sensors, we tried a couple different sensors, um, including uh, the HX7OB, which was nice because it afforded us the ability to inhale and exhale when playing. It also has um, readings when it's not playing, so there's a lot of opportunities for different types of instrumentation. And just from an aesthetic and tactile point of view, we wanted to use nicer push buttons um, just to make it more fun to play. Uh, next, we'll show a video of just the initial prototype of what it could sound like when it's fully assembled and working. Dual battery setup. As mentioned earlier, the urgency and the timeliness of the vape problem brought our team together. Transforming these vapes into the synthesizer is just one starting point. During our project, um, we've also encountered, discovered a lot of other incredible innovators taking on this issue. Like illusionist Vendim Gordis created this uh, kinetic brooch that is entirely crafted from all the components from the vape, discarded vapes. And also there is a vape camera with the pressure sensor being the shutter trigger created by Sebastian Beidegen, who is here with us at an open hardware summit. We hope our effort extends beyond simple repurposing. It is an invitation to imaginative action. We hope you join us in exploring the potential of creative reuse by reimagining discarded technology. We do more than just reducing weight. We underscore the significant environmental and societal impact of our consumption patterns. Be playful, be creative, and that by default is challenging the status quo. Thank you so much for your time listening to our talks. Myself and Carrie will be in person for demos and conversations. Thank you so much.